The Widow's Revenge, St. John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador. The strangest house in the old city of St. John's, Newfoundland, was situated in the East End before the Clematis Fire of 1892 destroyed that neighborhood. Well into the mid-20th century, however, many people were still alive who remembered the jury house and the widow and her son who lived there. It was impossible to forget such a drab dwelling and the chilling curse placed on its future tenants by the old woman. A written description of the dwelling is all we have left and as no photographs of it are known to exist. It was a house in perpetual darkness with a narrow cornice and a clapboard sliding, sliding long unpainted roof boards showed through where the shingles had rotted away. Yellow shades covered dusty, perpetually unwashed windows that were never opened, though the shades were usually drawn up halfway each morning. The front door was flushed with the street, but swung on rusty hinges each time it was opened. The woman who lived in the house, married late in life, had a baby boy, and then watched as her husband died when the child was but an infant. She reared him as best she could, taking on menial housekeeping jobs or the washing and ironing for neighbors. As the boy grew, he took, he too took on his share of work, delivering newspapers or performing odd jobs around St. John's. Though his mother was illiterate, the boy finished enough school to read and do his figures. St. John's in that era had a unique housing con convent. The custom of the period was to build houses on ground leased from landlords so that even though one owned the dwelling, rent had to be paid for the land upon which it was built. This was the case with the widow and her son. Each year, mother and son gathered enough money to pay their ground rent for the following year. In turn, the landlord gave them a receipt which the widow knew, even though she could neither read nor write, entitled them to continue living in the home in which she was raising her son. She carefully placed each year's receipt in a borrowed drawer lest anyone challenge her occupancy. In the time the widow's son became a man, he decided that his mother had worked long enough and hard enough to support their meager assistance and now he would become the head of the house. He had no training for anything but humble labor, but that was plentiful in St. John's and provided enough income to put food on the table and simple clothes on their backs and pay the yearly ground rent. He followed his mother's custom in later task, delivering the rent to the landlord and requesting the receipt with he dutifully turned over to his mother. The son fell in love. The young woman who became his bride agreed that she would move into the old house with her new husband and mother-in-law in order to save money. She was an expert decorator and soon the dreary house sparkled with new lace curtains and shades, freshly scrubbed floors and walls, and windows extricated from the accumulation of years of dust and grime. Even the hinges on the front door were oiled. A coat of Dr. Bunting green paint was applied to the exterior. Never before had residents in St. John's East End seen such a glorious transformation. But like for the widow, her son and his wife would not mirror the heartening changes in their home. A baby was born to the son's wife. Now there were four mouths to feed, four persons to clothe, four persons who relied upon the son's slight income for all their worldly needs, and the baby, most especially, required a level of, a level of care that made the son's weekly pay sadly inadequate. He thought long and hard about the problem. At night, he walked down to the harbor where he lived, where he would sit on the pier and think through his alternatives. There were few. He concluded that he had but one choice. He would pit, put off paying the yearly ground rent for a few weeks, maybe a month or two at the most. That savings would give his extra baby food, perhaps his wife and his mother an item of clothing apiece, and the rest he would set aside to pay the landlord. It wouldn't take many weeks to make good on the rent, he reasoned, only long enough to get ahead a little bit. After all, what was more important, the landlord who had plenty of money or his own family with their meager existence? There was the problem of the receipt. His mother would expect the slip of paper after the yearly payment. He had carried on the custom over the years. He had supported the household and had made sure his mother always got the receipt so she could put it away. He felt guilty about deceiving her, but what choice did he have? She would only see marks on the paper and assume they were the landlord's handwriting. It was a small deception, he decided, although the guilt felt he felt was misleading her was great. He found a sheet of white paper similar to the previous year's receipts and proudly gave it to her the year, the year he decided to delay the ground run. She smiled at her thoughtful son and placed it carefully in the burrow. A few weeks passed and the son found that he still didn't have enough save for the landlord and who didn't complain for he knew the family was honest. After six months though, the son grew worried. His modest savings weren't nearly enough for the payment. He called upon the landlord with the story of an ill mother, a sickly child, and unexpected expenses, none of which was true, but which trickery the son excused as necessary. 
During all the years since your father took out the lease, the understanding landlord said, every payment but this one has been met on time, and I can understand how it is with you. If everybody paid up as well as your father, your mother, and yourself have done, there would be small cause to worry over bad bills. Even a deception based upon the best motives can lead to tragic consequences. So it was with the family. Summer years passed, and each year the son put off his grand rent. Being always careful to forge a receipt for his mother, the landlord, who was at first caring and understanding, grew impatient. He demanded payment in full. When the son confessed that he could not oblige, the landlord foreclosed on the house. The widow wept on the day she was forced from the home in which she had lived most of her life. Her son was to blame. In her heart, she knew that, but as with many mothers, she refused to think ill of her child. Instead, she cursed the landlord for their indignity of being tossed out of their home. The family had no choice but to move into a tenement apartment which, it so happened, was just around the block from their home. Even the backyards yards adjoined and a window in the apartment looked out at their old house. Since he didn't want the house to sit empty for too long, the landlord placed it on the market. It was all too much for the widow who sat each day at the dingy tenement's back window, crying over the loss and screaming at anyone who seemed to be looking over the property. Nearly everyone in the neighborhood learned of the widow's plight and watched as she kept vigil at the window. Potential buyers of her home were scared off by her angry imprecautions. They should, should they buy the house, a curse would fall upon them and their families. A prominent St. John's business owner scorned the idea of an old woman's curse. He was without superstition. The house was in adequate condition and thus he could find no logical reason not to buy it. On an evening after he'd made arrangements with the landlord to buy the new property, the businessman was sitting at his home when a knock came at the door. He opened it to find the old widow kneeling at the threshold, her hands clasped beseechingly before him. Please, sir, I beg of you not to buy the only home my son has ever known and the one in which I have lived my life, she wailed. I know that you are a kind man at heart and would not trample upon an old woman's last wishes. I will pray for you every day and ask God to bring you and your family good fortune if you would only do as I ask. In her delusional mind, the widow thought that if the house remained vacant, the landlord would relent and allow her family to move back in. He was to blame. He was the one who had tossed the man on the street. He still believed her son deserved no culpability in that matter. I am sorry, my dear woman, the businessman replied. It is unfortunate that you lost your home, but that is none of my concern. I paid a fair price for the property and intend to move in with my own family as soon as needed repairs can be handled. I'm sure you will understand that it's just business, nothing personal. With that, he closed the door. The old woman's tears stained her shawl as she pulled herself to her feet and turned to leave. The, through narrow reddened eyes, she glanced back at the door. He had not heard the last from her, she promised. The businessman hired carpenters to repair his new house's roof and siding, painters to give it a fresh coat of paint, and handyman to replace the old windows with modern slashes. Light, light curtains allowed sunlight to penetrate the dark rooms for the first time in many years. All the while, the old window, widow sat at her window of her tiny apartment watching the activity at her house. Though her health was rapidly failing, she was in her denunciation of this man who was, has taken the roof from above my head. Soon the house was in readiness. The businessman, his wife, and two bright, vivacious teenage daughters, ages 17 and 15, were thrilled with the remodeling and thought this would be just the place to spend the rest of their lives. The yard had not been kept up for a very long time, and after the remodeling was completed, had become the family's main chore. Planting flower beds, a vegetable garden, and new grass took up most of their free time. Shortly after his family moved in, the father was clearing an area in the backyard quite close to the picket fence that divided the property from the tenement in which the widow and her family lived. He often saw her sitting at the window, muttering to herself and cursing her ill fortune, but did his best to ignore her. On this day, she was again at the window. He wasn't looking her way when he heard her voice rising to a pitch he had never heard before. When he looked up, he saw that she had thrown open the window and was leaning out in his direction, shaking her wrinkled fist at him. My curse upon you, you robber of the widow's might, she screamed. May your life be blasted and may the brightest flower of your family soon fade and perish. With that, she fell back from the window. The businessman was afraid she had collapsed and ran to a neighbor's door. He explained what he had just seen, but kept it to himself what she had said, and asked the neighbor to check on the old woman. He explained that it was probably best for him not to go himself to the apartment. The widow had collapsed unconscious on the floor. She was taken to her bed, and there she remained for the final days of her life. I'll haunt him. I'll haunt him. My curse upon him. She muttered over and over again as she lay in bed. Her priest, neighbors, and even her son and daughter-in-law tried to persuade her not to depart with a curse against the businessman and his family upon her lips. She ignored them. Then one night, she clasped the neighbor's woman's hand and said, I am near the end. I can feel myself, myself slipping away. God is good, and we must always hope for the best, the woman friend whispered. Leaning close, if you should die tonight, you would not want to enter the world beyond the grave with a curse upon your conscience. 
The old woman nodded. And so you won't haunt him? The friend asked. I will. I will haunt him for all eternity. The old widow screeched and fell back against her pillow. She died without saying another word. A few days later, the businessman was asleep in his bed when he suddenly sat bolt upright. Still groggy from sleep, he was vaguely aware of a distant toiling bell. One, two, three times it chimed. He was frightened. Something within him said these were familiar sounds, yet he could not focus his consciousness on the resource. His brain was still too clattered from sleep, but he had to know. Where had he heard that before? He lifted himself slowly to a sitting position at the edge of the bed and felt the soft, cool evening breeze drift through the open window. Of course, the bells were from the old clock tower. It could not possibly be as late as three o'clock in the morning. Surely he must have slept through the first nine chimes and only become conscious of the final three strokes. He got to his feet, tiptoed to the window, which looked out over the backyard. The moist air felt good upon his face as he leaned out and gazed into the night. Then he felt his legs go weak and his heart started pounding so that he thought his chest would explode. He gripped the window ledge and stared transfixed across the yard at the widow's apartment and into the dead woman's face. She was at the window where she had sat at vigil for so many months, shaking her bony finger at him. A pale light seemed to surround her. He leaped back into his own bed and pulled the covers over his head, shaking and moaning so that his wife was roused from her sleep. Wake up, Jen, you're having a nightmare, she scolded. He did not respond, but continued to burrow into the bedclothes as if he could escape the horrible sight so easily. Jim, Jim, wake up, poor man, his wife cried. He grew quiet and finally sat up. I must have been dreaming, he said, not daring to speak to his wife of what he had seen for fear she would think he's crazy. What time is it, he asked. It must be after midnight, his wife assured him. You're all nerved up. You must have had a very upsetting dream. Lie down and think of pleasant things before you go back to sleep. But I don't think I was dreaming. All of it, he insisted. I'm sure I was awake and heard the town clock striking. I must see what the time is. He struck a match and in its flickering glow saw that the small clock on the bedstand showed one minute past midnight. Nothing more was said of the incident. Whether it had all been a dream or whether he had seen the ghost of the dead woman nod at his brain, but he could neither resolve the dilemma nor escape the fear of its continual presence and his thoughts brought to even the most mundane of daily tasks. All was quiet for some time until an evening several weeks later. The wife was alone. Her husband was away on a business trip and their daughters were visiting schoolmates. She was sitting in the kitchen with a collection of mending on her lap. The evening was rapidly rapidly shifting from daylight to darkness, and in the twilight she had lighted an oil lamp to help her see the sewing needles and thread. A gust of wind abruptly swept through the room, extinguishing the lamp. A chill went down the wife's spine at the suddenness with which heavy dust settled in the room. She had not entirely believed her husband's explanation on the other earlier night that he had simply had a nightmare, and too, she had learned about the old woman's supposed curse. As she reached for a match with which to relight the lamp wick, the deep silence was broken by three sharp, distinct raps that resounded throughout the house, yet seemed to inanimate from no one place in particular. She jumped at the unexpected sound, carefully setting the sewing on the kitchen table. She got up to see if someone had come through the front door. She froze as she peered through the kitchen window doorway. Standing inside the front entrance was a small old woman with a shawl covering her clothes and drawn up to obstruct most of her face. With an outstretched hand, the hag started shuffling down the hallway toward the doorway in which the terrified homeworker stood. With a scream, the wife fell back into the kitchen and collapsed. The next thing she knew, soft voices were urging her to awaken. She had opened her eyes to see her daughters and a neighbor leaning over her. She was in her own bed, warm blankets pulled up to the chin. Wasn't it all dark, she asked? Yes, that it was, said the neighbor. I heard you scream and came rushing over. I found you there on the floor of the kitchen and not a lamp lit in the entire house. And the front door was wide open. Seems to me the wind blew out of the kitchen lamp. The chimney was still hot. Did, did you see anyone? The wife stammered, still very agitated from the events. Nobody, the neighbor said. Well, nobody but an old beggar woman limping down the street. The girls added that they had two seen a stranger some distance from the house. Oh, I was terribly scared, the mother said. The draft, the draft must have blown out the light, and then the beggar woman suddenly coming into the hall, at least I think it was, she broke off her final words, not daring to think about who else it might have been. All of these elements must have combined at the right moment to produce this weird effect, the mother reasoned. The wind gusts must have blown opened the front door, then put out the lamp the same moment the beggar woman rapped. Yet, the wind was so cold as it came down the hallway ahead of the stranger, so cold that it seemed to penetrate to the very bones. There was nothing conclusive in these two incidents to suggest that the widow's curse had taken hold of the businessman's family. Each might have been attributed to simple conscious <clears throat> coincidence, where it's not for what happened to an exquisite late Newfoundler spring night several months later. A thin... A thin Strand of daylight remained on the western horizon as the deep blue sky darkened on its journey toward night. A sprinkling of stars twinkled their greetings to the shadows that fell over St. John's. St. John's. Boats in the harbor swayed gently at their moorings. The world seemed a warm and generous place. 
On that street and in that house where the widow once lived, the dinner hour had passed as pleasantly as usual. Father and mother had retired to the parlor, he to finish some paperwork, and she to resume some intricate crocheting. The younger daughter was in her upstairs bedroom overlooking the street. Their older daughter, the blooming rose of her father's eye, sat by the window in a room using the fading daylight to finish a piece of embroidery. The soft air coming through the open window nudged the lace curtains aside and blew softly across the girl's face. She let the embroidery drop to her lap as she leaned back in the soft chair cushions. Her eyes closed. She let her mind wander among the million thoughts that young girls everywhere must have. Minutes drifted by. The room settled into darkness. Suddenly the girl, who had been wandering among the stars, felt a slight chill. She opened her eyes. From where she sat, there was a clear view across the backyards. At first, there was only darkness at the dead woman's apartment. But gradually, a pinpoint of light appeared in one window where the woman had sat, screeching her disgust to the girl's family. The light grew in intensity, and in its glow, the girl saw the old widow sitting in her chair at the window. But this time, she was a corpse in a torn dress and a ragged shawl. She raised her arm and pointed a bony finger toward the young girl. The light growing in intensity about the specter became like a shaft of rays spilling out across the yards, up the side of the girl's home, and finally through her window and into her room, where she felt ensnared by its intensity. As the beacon stretched between the two windows, the widow's ghost guided out her window along the path of light and hovered outside the girl's window. She rested her rotting arms on the sill and raised her grisly face. Shreds of flesh hung like streamers from her skull, where the eyes and nose should have been were only dark, dank holes. She stared through the window, her mouth pulled back in hideous, toothless grin. She reached toward the girl. The scream brought the girl's parents rushing into the bedroom. They found their daughter withering on the floor, hysterical. She was crying and speaking a gibberish about lights and faces and old women, but completely unable to make any sense to her tormented parents. A doctor came the next day and diagnosed the condition as paralytic epilepsy, brought on by some sort of shock. He gave her medicine and even brought in several colleagues to help in the diagnosis, but it was all to no avail. The girl grew weaker with each passing day, unable to eat or to communicate with those around her. The doctor surmised that her brain would have suffered such a trauma from whatever even transpired that night that she was lost, for, lost forever. And in that condition, this girl, this burnished flower in, his parents, in her parents' garden, passed from this earth. The widow's curse had triumphed.